thank you everyone who's on the line. I'm sure there'll be more trickling in. Uh, we're really grateful that you have taken some time out of your very busy schedule to be here with us today. We're really excited about this opportunity just to have a chance to get all the university centers together. Uh, we're hoping to do this as much as possible, but we will definitely talk about that more later. Um, I'm just trying to flip through the screen, so sorry for the technical difficulties. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so on the call today, I will just be providing a brief, oh my gosh, <laughs> a brief overview of EDA. What happened? Are you losing control? I think I have lost control. Try now. I see the mouse. going to give up remote control. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to the agenda, please. <laughs> All right, back to the agenda. All right. Uh, we'll be providing a brief overview of the University Center program, followed by a discussion about the Educational Association of University Centers. With Dan Ripke, we'll have a case study with uh, University uh, Mississippi, or with Mississippi State University. We've got Jeffrey Rupp on the line. He'll be uh, giving a pretty exciting uh, presentation about the work they're doing at their university center, and then we'll have some announcements at the end. So let's just jump right in. Next slide. All right. So, who am I? <laughs> Uh, my name is Bernadette Grafton. I am the University Center Coordinator for EDA. I'm in our Washington, D.C. headquarters office. Uh, we haven't had a University Center Coordinator for quite some time. I've been in this position for a couple of years now. And my main, my, my main goal is here just to provide some policy and program guidance to our six EDA regional offices that manage your actual UC awards. Um, I'm thinking high level here, uh, just trying to get my arms around the program as a whole and make sure that it's going in a, a good direction. Um, and so why are we here today? Well, there's 63 university centers across the nation, spread over 47 states. And I doubt that everyone knows who each other is, uh, let alone all of the university centers we have. Um, it's just, it's hard to uh, to keep that network strong, and so we're here today to try to build that up. Um, there's just a, a lack of a strong value proposition uh, for the University Center program, which is one of the, the primary impetuses for this webinar. I really wanted to get everybody together just to have this conversation about the, the program, where it stands, where we need it to go, um, and some of the goals that we have. We need to focus on developing a clear description of what this program is, what it's for, who it's for, and what outcomes we're seeing from the program at large. As it stands now, we don't really have this clear description. Um, so that's, that's the need. Um, there's just a, a limited engagement between university centers, especially ones in different regional offices around the country. Um, and so we'd love to build that up and create more opportunity for that type of engagement. Uh, there's also an opportunity to develop a stronger network of university centers, and this begins with a conversation. So this is that conversation. So welcome to that. Thank you for being here. Um, and where are we going? Well, the focus of this webinar is, as one of many regular webinars, is just to serve as a gathering place for everyone to learn from each other, to ask questions, share ideas, make connections, and stay up to date on the latest news of the University Center program. Like any federally funded program, it's important to continue to make the case as to why funding for this program is necessary and what outcomes we're seeing as a result of the funding. We must be able to clearly and effectively articulate how university centers have been a key stakeholder group for EDA and how they've been serving as significant economic development assets supporting regional economic growth. Our NOFO, uh, I'm sure you've all completely memorized the University Center NOFO by now, uh, so you will be familiar with this language that university centers collaborate with other EDA partners by providing expertise and technical assistance to develop, implement, support regional strategies that result in job creation and high-skilled regional talent pools along with supporting the region's innovation clusters. 
And I know from attending many of the university center regional convenings that there are plenty of UCs that are doing this exact thing. There's some great work happening out of our university centers, but we need to amplify that more. As a program, we need to start sharing our stories in, uh, in a stronger way. We need to share outcomes, um, especially outcomes that align with the goals of the program and that can be attributed to activities conducted under the UC program. These are critical data points that we have to capture, and I know some of you are already capturing these. I just want to encourage you to keep doing that. Um, and for those who haven't started to capture these types of data points, I'm encouraging you as well to, to start thinking about how you can do that. Uh, there'll be opportunities for that um, in the future moving forward. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end, um, but we want to get in the habit of tracking outcomes and activities. Um, so that was really fast. Um, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end, but right now I want to turn it over to Dan Rickey, who's the current Executive Director of the Educational Association of University Centers. He will give you some history of the program and some more details about why we're here. Uh, but just to, for some brief background, he's been in the UC world for decades, so he's a great resource for everyone, and I'm excited that he has taken some time to be with us here today. So thanks, Dan. Great. Thank you. Uh, all right. Let me see how well, kind of still got control here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time zone you're in. Thank you, and thank you, Bernadette, for pulling this together. I think this might be a first. <laughs> so <laughs> it's great that we can have all the university centers come together. Um, I'm actually here representing uh, the Educational Association University Centers. Uh, Larry Molnar, who is the president of the board for the EAUC, uh, had an emergency, could not be here today. So he uh, provided me with his notes of what he wanted to have presented. So I'm basically go over that real quick. Um, for those of you who are not aware, EDA is the only federal agency solely focused on economic development in the US government. EDA works with communities across the country to, on regional economic development strategies to attract private investment, create jobs and economically distressed areas of the country. The EDA was established under Public Works and Economic Development Act of 1965 to generate new jobs, help retain existing jobs, and stimulate industrial and commercial growth in economically troubled areas. Beginning in the late 1970s, the EDA created, uh, began to provide funding to colleges and universities to establish an EDA University Center, uh, a new innovative program to create a gateway to higher educational systems, both to have these institutions of higher ed work off campus with off campus organizations, institutions, and individuals. Uh, the EDA University Center also provides a means of colleges and universities to engage faculty, staff, and students in communities, regions, economic development organizations, and private sector projects off campus. This provided an opportunity for, to bring a vast knowledge and expertise and experience of, and resources of higher educational institutions uh, to provide the economies and quality of life in urban areas and across the country. One of the greatest strengths of the program is its ability to adapt to each region, as well as leveraging the higher, each higher educational institution's particular strengths. So the focus of these initiatives was especially important in areas with economic distress, or there, those areas experience economic dislocation due to natural disasters, plant closures, and other sudden and severe economic dislocation. So um, again, the University Center Program is the only federally funded program nationally that leverages higher educational networks to the benefit of U.S. communities and the economy. So the program has been in existence for almost 50 years um, and we've made great strides and great impacts um, leveraging the university, but the big question is moving forward, how do we move forward in the most um, effective manner? Uh, one of the things that, that Bernadette and I have chatted with, as well as Larry and others with the AUC, is that while we have great impacts, uh, we don't have necessarily a unified voice of what is the impact of our centers. Um, I've run an EDA University Center for 30 years, and we were masters at leveraging what little funding we had to produce dramatic impacts, but we didn't spend a, dramatic, uh, a great deal of money or resources um, speaking about the impacts of our programs. And we realized that if we really want to continue to exist, we need to do a much better job of quantifying both our quantitative impacts, as well as um, getting out there with our qualitative impacts, meaning the impact through success stories 
or in this day and age, it's frankly just tagging your stories on Twitter with the EDA hashtag. So which, Bernadette, what's that hashtag again? <laughs> oh, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's at US underscore EDA. <laughs> Sorry, I should, have, I should have told you I was going to put you on the spot. So, so anyway, um, the EAUC has uh, existed for decades itself, uh, both in its previous name, uh, it was unified under NAMTEC, the National Association for Management Technical Assistance Center, and has evolved um, to continue to be a voice on Capitol Hill and elsewhere to help speak about the impacts of our program and make sure that the successes of our program are known by policymakers uh, and by, and frankly, even our own institutions, because our own institutions are the ones that make the final decision on providing cash match or buyout time for faculty, et cetera. So um, in order to make this happen, uh, the EAUC over the past uh, 20 years has used a number of tools, one of which was an annual gathering in Washington, D.C. every spring. Uh, and we did not hold that event this year. We're going through kind of a transitional phase as uh, Tom McClure went into retirement. So we are currently planning to have a Washington, D.C. conference in the spring of, of 2020. Additionally, we will, uh, we're looking to have a joint event at the University Economic Development Association conference in Reno, Nevada uh, toward the end of September. And we'll be posting additional information about that to all of you and Bernadette and I can, can share that information out. Um, in addition to these two annual get-togethers, however, uh, Bernadette and I and others have come up with the idea of doing bi-monthly webinars. In other words, every other month we will have a call like this where we'll bring together university centers and as well as our practitioners and our EDA representative from the local offices to talk about what they've seen as far as best practices. So, uh, and for example, one of the ones coming up, the burden that I think we'll talk about later is, um, well, we have Jeffrey's presentation today, but we will also have one about joint partnerships between university centers and economic development districts. So one tool is a bi-monthly webinar. The other tool is a relaunching of the EAUC website. Uh, the EAU, EAUC website will have a members only section where members can uh, post uh, their own reports. They can see reports from other university centers. They can uh, share best practices on things like how to best use social media to get the word out to your elected officials or policymakers. So it will be a, again, a members only place for um, the EDA university centers and I believe the EAD, EDA staff to be able to go in and share these best practices. And then part of that is best practices on leveraging social media. So uh, with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Bernadette. Are you unmuted? Oh. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so we're just going over to uh, to Jeff's presentation, I believe, at this point. Oh, no, we're doing. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so. As Dan mentioned, we have Jeffrey Rupp here on the call. He has prepared a presentation that will kind of guide us through some of the key activities that Mississippi State University has been undertaking through the UC program, uh, highlighting some of these, uh, these key outcomes that, um, that are crucial for regional economic development. So I'm really excited for him to share with you the work they've been doing. Uh, we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers specific to his presentation, but I also want you to be thinking of any questions you have for uh, either me or Dan uh, regarding the, the UC program or EAUC as a whole. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Jeff and uh, yeah, take it away. All right. Well, Bernadette, I don't know if we've ever heard the term, uh, the words excitement and PowerPoint in the same uh, sentence, but that's good. Uh, I don't know if I have control because I'm trying. All right, hold on. I'll I'll send you control real quick here. Hold on here. All right, you're gonna get a little pop up on your screen right now. And if it doesn't work, I can go ahead and I'll take control back. Yeah, it used to give me a prompt, and I don't see the prompt now. Let me see if that. Uh, oh, there it is up there. Hang on. All right. Request email. All right. I am requesting the control of the Starship Enterprise here. And I am approving it. 
Wow, you're a brave man. Engage. All right, here we go. So uh, our university center is housed in the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship and Outreach here at Mississippi State. And it's not, there it is. And uh, like all of you, um, we're lucky that the EDA allows us to tailor our university centers to the people that we serve. Unfortunately for us in Mississippi, we are serving folks with uh, a lack of resources. Uh, the bad news is we can't pour tons of capital into projects. Um, we really are bootstrapping just about everything. The good news is when you're operating on that, that level, uh, that micro view, you can have some easy wins. And uh, we, we are proud of those, but uh, we do some of the th same things you all do, support existing economic ecosystems. We mentor startups and we develop uh, future entrepreneurs. We'll go into some of that. As far as supporting existing economic ecosystems, I'm sure uh, most of you do the same things. We use MBA teams to uh, do applied research for companies. These can be large companies such as Yokohama Tires, all the way down to uh, mom and pops on Main Street. We have a public maker space, which we'll talk about a bit, and then we do uh, some business mentoring as well. Uh, with the MBA teams, here are some of our clients that we've worked with, and I'm just going to give two quick examples, starting with uh, the Mississippi Brewers Guild, because I, I feel many of you will uh, like the fact that it has beer. In it. So uh, Mississippi uh, was one of the last states to really allow and promote craft brewing in the state. And the reason was the legislature uh, did not want to touch anything that had to do with alcohol. And uh, it was very frustrating because to make some of the better beers, the IPAs, the stouts, you have to have a higher alcohol content in the, in the beers. And they wouldn't touch it uh, unless we could show an economic reason to do so. So using a team of MBA students and working with the Mississippi Brewers Guild, we did an economic impact uh, study on how uh, the craft brewing industry impacted the state of Tennessee. And armed with that information, the legislature changed the laws and we went from having one brewer in the state to uh, now we've got more than a dozen and an economic impact of uh, close to half a billion dollars a year. Again, not a huge win, but it was significant. It was significant. And so we're, we're proud of being uh, of playing a part in that. A, an interesting spin-out business from that was a gentleman uh, named Troy Durego who made bread. He had a little bakery in Starkville, Mississippi, sold at the farmer's market and had a subscription service once a week. You could go pick up the bread that you like, which is a neat little business, but it wasn't uh, a huge moneymaker. Once the craft beer industry started to flourish, he had the idea of going around the state and collecting the spent grains at the breweries. So once they did their mash or whatever it is, uh, they would normally throw out those grains and he would collect them all and he would turn them into crackers. He created a company called Grain Elevator. And I'm sorry, it's a blurry picture, but he would use the different grains for the different beers to make different flavored crackers. And uh, his last, I think, big uh, milestone was he was negotiating with Whole Foods to get in their stores. So that is a, a win on Main Street uh, that we are really pleased with. So that's the work of our MBA students. And then we go to our, um, our Entrepreneurship Center. And this is a uh, space we opened about three years ago. No taxpayer money was used to build it. It cost about a million dollars. And uh, we have any student on campus is welcome to come through and start a business. We are averaging about 100 startups a year, uh, active startups. We have our own angel network now. We have had six uh, angel pitches. Five of the companies, student startups that pitch now have million dollar valuations. A big win for us is all five have stayed in Mississippi. Uh, we're a state that likes to go after uh, big manufacturing, automobile, tires, things like that. And those jobs are great and we need them, but we're losing the creative class. And so we hope that by developing the entrepreneurs uh, and some kind of ecosystem for them, that they stay in Mississippi. And so far, the five uh, big uh, million dollar valuation companies have all gone back to their hometowns in Mississippi and, and planted roots. And one of those companies uh, is called Glow. 
And the gentleman on the left is uh, Hagen Walker, who's an engineering student. And we talked about this at a conference in DC a year or so ago. And he interned at Tesla Motors. They offered him a full-time job. And he turned it down to create a plastic ice cube that lights up when you put it in water or your favorite beverage. Uh, we thought it was a novel idea and uh, we helped him start the business and he was having some success with it. Uh, but his business model really changed when he got a letter from a mom who said that she had an autistic son who couldn't, uh, who would fight her, physically fight her when she tried to give him a bath. And she was so frustrated that one day she threw a glow cube in the tub, it lit up, and now she can't get the, uh, her son out of the tub. And so when Hagen heard that, they took that same cube and they started making uh, a line called Glow Pals. And they use these uh, just like you would expect, you know, throw them in the bath, but they're also using them in classrooms, preschool for uh, sensory education. And on top of that, uh, millennials like worthy causes, they give a portion of that, of uh, the profits to the Bassey's Children's Hospital in, in Jackson, Mississippi. And this, is, uh, this, this really is a good example of, of how millennials like to do business. Uh, they are now in every Cracker Barrel in the country. So if you stop at Cracker Barrel, look for Glow Pals. They are in bath bombs in Target. And uh, we expect them to have a very successful exit, multi-million dollar exit in, uh, in the not too distant future. So we're very, very proud of them. Uh, Bernadette talked about, or Dan talked about the importance of partnering uh, with economic development organizations. This office here is at our local economic development office and it mirrors the conference room I'm sitting in now. And it allows me to go off campus and I don't know what your campuses are like, but I'm sure that parking is a big issue. And to get to our place, you have to enter codes, go through gates, and it's, uh, it's very, very difficult, and the campus police are, are draconian and handing out tickets. So we have a satellite office at the Economic Development Office downtown in Starkville, where we can, you, if you see the monitor in that picture, that's actually uh, where I'm sitting now. So we can get people around that table and mentor uh, anyone, not just in Starkville, but in the state. Our extension office has a, an office in every county, so we can get folks from the Delta, for instance, to their extension office, and then get the expertise we need around the table and try to mentor them and help them uh, grow their businesses. Uh, Appalachian Regional Commission gave us 100 grand uh, for this project, and they, uh, we also partnered with USDA Rural Development on a, another project I'll show you. I have deals with three economic development partners in the state where we provide the MBA teams uh, and the expertise for members of the chamber. And what that does, it, it helps them locally drive up chamber membership because there are a lot of complaints. Why do I join the chamber? You get uh, a warm beer and cold appetizer at a business after hours three times a year. And now you can get some real deep level applied research uh, to help you, and that's a benefit of being a member of the local chamber. So it, it's a bit of community development, hopefully a bit of economic development as well. We also partnered with USDA to open a public maker space, and uh, this is the gray building there. This was a grand opening we had, I believe, in February or March. Uh, and what this is, it operates like a gym membership. You can come in and do woodworking, 3D printing, prototyping, engraving, whatever you need. And instead of having to buy all the expensive tools and equipment yourself uh, for 25 bucks for a gym membership, uh, you can use this. Now, we had no idea if this would catch on at all. Uh, an early signal that it might be a success was it was picked up by the Miami Herald and the Kansas City Star, I believe. So I think the novelty of it uh, was somewhat attractive. Uh, and so in the six months it's been open, we've had 3,000 visitors. We have 60 memberships, monthly memberships. We sell day passes as well. We've done uh, several prototypes and almost 4,000 hours of uh, 3D printing. And a side benefit is we have started a program with low to mod income kids where we bring them in and make small robots. Uh, we had a Father's Day workshop where they came in and made things for Father's Day. And uh, so we're bringing in the Boys and Girls Clubs and things like that. So we're trying to teach them uh, some skills, but also we have found that there's a, a, a self-confidence and self-worth issue here. And in Mississippi, that's, uh, 
that's part of the puzzle. That's something we have to try to help solve. So we are going to continue this. Uh, we get sponsors to pay for it. They're roughly about $500 for all the, uh, all the components. But we hope that we're going to continue bringing groups in around Christmas. I want to bring them in to make uh, you know, things for their parents, mom and dad, grandparents. And uh, we think this is a, a real nice way to be tethered to the community. And, and this is taking off more than we thought. We're looking to expand now. There's a lot of demand for cottage food, so we're uh, looking at a uh, commercial kitchen right now and a kiln as well. The front of the shop is retail, so uh, we have 18 folks in there selling their goods, and there's a process for that. Uh, so we give them a storefront as well. We also have a camp where uh, this group you see, uh, the gentleman in blue hat's one of our student workers, but uh, this group came in, spent a week, living on campus, they had to get to know each other, form a business, develop products, manufacture the products, and then advertise and sell the products at a pop-up shop at the end of the week. So you can see the board meeting on the right. They're thinking about what they're making, how they're gonna sell it. They're making the stuff on the left. Here is uh, one of the uh, items they made, which was a plant hanger. Uh, and the good news was we let them keep all their profit. So these campers went home with 1600 bucks, much to their parents' surprise. Uh, we actually sent them home with money. And again, this is a way to try to teach uh, financial literacy, entrepreneurship, uh, self-esteem, self-confidence, and it's good for the community. The next thing we're doing, there's a real gap in Mississippi in, in teaching kids K through 12 that they can be their own boss because the model we use is go to work at the car plant, go to work at the tire plant. Again, nothing wrong with that, but we've got to keep the creative class. So we've started doing our own shark tanks uh, at schools around the state. And they're sponsored. This one was by International Paper. And what we do is we go in. Uh, the first one we did in Starkville had 60-some kids sign up, which we thought was pretty good. We picked nine finalists, and we brought them to our uh, e-center here. And while they were here, we talked a bit with them about some of the basics of entrepreneurship. We also had a marketing professor uh, do a marketing session. We had someone from SBDC do a very basic uh, business plan uh, model for them. And then over on the left, we assigned each of them uh, one of our student entrepreneurs who had started a business and was making money. And for two weeks, they worked with them on their pitches. And then we had a big pitch competition downtown open to the public, and we had winners, and they won thousands of dollars and also uh, were invited to continue pursuing their ideas uh, through our recent. We would work with them and try to get bring the product to, uh, to market. So we found that very successful and we had meetings today with the local bank about expanding that around the state. And so the only group that left for us uh, to try to reach was K through sixth or seventh grade. And so we uh, started, a, uh, we signed up with a national program called Lemonade Day. And at the last, uh, this is a really neat national program if you're not familiar with it. You have to buy the license, but you get very good workbooks. We actually had this as curriculum in some of the elementary schools. You get a uh, book bag with it. Uh, they tell the kids that you need to take your profits, save some, spend some, and then share some. So the local Humane Society made money. Uh, one young lady was selling lemonade uh, for research for autism to help her younger brother. Uh, I'm a former mayor, so I can tell you the optics of driving downtown on Lemonade Day and seeing we had 95 lemonade stands wow. in, a, in an area that had maybe 75,000 people. So it really was a warm, warm event. And it's also a way for us to introduce entrepreneurship and uh, financial literacy to kids K through 12. So that sort of sums up what we do. And again, I know some of this is, is, is pretty simple, but uh, there is a real need in Mississippi to supply the basic tenants and building blocks of what entrepreneurship is and what uh, uh, financial literacy are. And we think hopefully that this has had some kind of uh, impact in community and economic development. So that is our story at stake. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. Um, I would love to take a few minutes if anyone has any questions for him about their program, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask.
Thanks. Good night. <laughs> Not yet. I, I really would like to hear from anyone who may be doing similar things that we could tweak ours and make it better. I put him to sleep. Uh, I don't have a question. I well, I wanted to one to say congratulations. I, you're doing amazing things. My uh, quick question. I thought it was really interesting. Sorry, this is Kathy from University of Florida. You had a metric on your valuations, which I've never seen that metric before, and I think that's a really innovative way to showcase metrics in a way. Can you talk a little bit more about how you came about that and, and how that's working for you? Because I haven't seen that before, but I love the idea. Well, so our e-center has sort of been a work in progress, and uh, the director, Eric Hill, uh, who's behind me, became the director when he was 25. He's an engineering grad here. He has started and sold three businesses. He's the guy you want, and he's not academic, right? And he kept ref he has kept refining the program. And the one thing we were lacking, uh, we have a monthly Shark Tank. We give up to seventy five hundred dollars, right? That that is not a very big runway. Uh, we needed an angel network, and the uh, the problem was the foundation found that threatening. They thought those were going to be alumni dollars that they could capture in the foundation that were going to go to this angel network. And it took us a year, uh, and it finally took some of our bigger alums uh, to go to the foundation and, and put their foot down because money talks, right? So we uh, have the Bulldog Angel Network now. We have 37 members, and we have put six deals in front of them. And obviously, um, the angels take an equity stake. And we, we get our valuation from that, right? So if, if I'm giving you $100,000 for 10% of your company, your valuation should be a million dollars, in theory. Um, so those are actually companies that have been invested in it, have the valuation. It's not just uh, a hypothetical valuation. It's actually companies that have been invested in at that value. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that, okay. That, okay. I see. All right. Thank you. And again, impressive. Thank you. Uh, that and, was different than I had thought it was. I thought you were making the valuation. I didn't realize they had actually been funded, though. Oh, so, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. Um, even as an ex-politician, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's what I was like. That's an interesting way to do it. But okay, thank you. No, it is based on, on, on the math. But one other piece of this, we just, in the last two months, uh, got permission from the university for a sidecar investment. So now the, um, the university center can take a small piece of the action and invest in these companies. Very, very small, a couple thousand dollars. But we hope down the road, if we get a hit, you know, your Florida Gatorade, you know, if we, we could help fund the East Center because that's always an issue. Um, we have a question that just popped up. Um, is the Angel Network its own 501c3 or, uh, or six? Yeah, um, and I don't know, and I can ask Eric, uh, the way it operates, uh, I can tell you this because it's unique. A lot of angel networks require you to put up fifty, dollars $100,000, and then we'll make the investments for you. To join this one, it's 400 bucks a year, that's it, and that's for administrative and legal fees. And then you look at the deals, pass and play, and put up as much or as little as you want, or just pass on the deal entirely. Uh, and we have members of... Uh, that have no affiliation with the university. I think there's a guy that's affiliated with Blackstone uh, that joined just because they want to see the deals. So that's been, uh, that's worked out for us. Hey, Bernadette, are, awesome. these, are these questions going to be available afterwards where I might be able to respond to them? Because I see them flying by and- uh, is Yeah, there we, can, we can print out the questions. <laughs> we want essay um, responses. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so there's a question here on funded deals receiving follow-up funding. We have partnered with a uh, quasi-governmental organization called Innovate Mississippi, and they have their own angel network, and they have some one-to-one -one match uh, angel funds, and we have piggybacked together and uh, doubled the funding on, on some of our, our startups. Some of these. Carla, Great. There's another <laughs> There's another question. Um, this is actually from uh, one of our staff. 
Uh, Sally, so she's asking how long has MSU been funded with this particular University Center grant um, and if you've had similar programs before that were funded from EDA and how do you differentiate the value that this program is adding to your, your overall work? Yeah, so uh, this program has been here since the dawn of time, since we were writing on stone tablets. We haven't been able to find when it started. I mean, it goes back 15, 20 years, and I have not found when it officially started, so I'm sorry I can't answer that. We had a pivotal shift about five years ago when we made a conscious effort to move the office into uh, the Entrepreneurship Center because we could do so much to help the entrepreneurs, and there was a lot of synergy there. Uh, so in the last five years, the program has changed dramatically. Jeffrey, where was it located before? It was located upstairs in the office of uh, the uh, graduate studies in College of Business. And, but that sort of kept us just in the College of Business. As, as you folks know, so many great ideas come out of engineering, but they don't know how to monetize the ideas. So this was a game changer uh, setting up shop here in the uh, East Center. And that's a good example of how silos can be broken down by using EDA. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Another yeah. question that came. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, real quick, talk about breaking down silos, and I know we've all fight that battle. In the past, we were made to send all of our student startups to the incubator at the research park. All right? This is rural Mississippi. Our research park is basically a pasture. Millennials don't want to be in a research park. And I, it literally took over a year of fighting uh, with the provost's office to let me send our student startups downtown. I did a deal with the Chamber of Commerce where that office is I have down there, where in addition to the office space, they gave me the third floor of their uh, chamber office, and we were able to start incubating students downtown. The first client they had was Glow, the Glow Drinks. Then they have since moved and taken over a big abandoned corner shop in downtown Starkville and have 20 some employees. Moving out of the research park was absolutely critical for us, for us. Hmm. A couple more questions. Great. Um, so how did you recruit the middle school age students? All right, so uh, the place where Glow took over is a really cool bungalow downtown. And uh, it's all lit up and it's, you know, it's hip and groovy millennials running a business, but it's a big space. And we invited them down for lemonade and cinnamon rolls. And uh, we did it at five o'clock after school one day. We didn't know who would show up. And there were well over 100 people there, standing room only. I tell you, there's a hunger. And it really showed the importance of the uh, middle and high school uh, STEM teachers. Uh, this contest was open to public, private, faith-based, homeschool, public schools, everyone. The public school teachers that are teaching this were so engaged that their students just kick butt. Yeah. Uh, we had, uh, there's a question from Dominique at, at Georgia Southern uh, about, can you describe your relationship physically and organizationally with the SBDC program? Yeah, so our SBDC is located in that vast wasteland that's the research part, uh, but we have a great relationship with him. We send him clients. He sends us clients. Uh, when we did Lemonade Day or the Innovation Challenge, he was over here mentoring the kids. He, you know, we taught a session. We couldn't have a better relationship, and it has a lot to do with the uh, the guy who's the head of the SBDC. Okay. Great. Uh, one other question is, how many faculty do you have involved in this program, and how many staff members do you have in the center? Yeah, so our center is operated on a shoestring. For the longest time, it was just Eric and myself, and in the last year and a half, we were, uh, got some funding for an admin, uh, and she's been fantastic. We have four or five student workers that are paid for from the uh, entrepreneurship side. Uh, we have a full-time employee that runs the idea shop, uh, one of our graduates downtown. Uh, but if you are in here, you're wearing every hat. So we're, we're very thinly staffed. And are each of those people that you mentioned, are they funded under the UC, the EDA UC program, or is it kind of dispersed funding? 
I think Eric, the director, is getting a piece of UC funding. I used to have a graduate assistant, uh, but we don't have that anymore. Okay. Okay. Well, there were no other questions that have come through. If there are others, we can capture those and make sure we respond via email. Um, but I would like to move on to make sure we, uh, we can finish out the webinar and um, talk about the next step. All right, so uh, the next webinar will be September 25th. It's a Wednesday, just like this one, it will be at 2 or 3 p.m., we'll send out a notice. Uh, we just need to settle on a couple of things. Um, we, as Dan alluded to earlier, we will have a university center on talking about how they have collaborated with one or more EDDs in their area. We would really like to um, encourage as many UCs as possible to, to work with their EDDs and vice versa. Um, so that, that particular webinar will be open to all university centers as well as economic development districts. So we're hoping that it can be a really engaging conversation with that and learning just how, how some have done that in the past. Um, so stay tuned for that. Dan will send out another invite shortly, maybe in the next uh, couple of weeks. We'll get that out to you all. Um, and also on the next webinar, we're hoping to, uh, to have an opportunity to describe a little bit more about these new metrics that, um, that we've briefly mentioned already. Um, EDA has been working towards a better system of GPRA collection. Um, you're all familiar with our current GPRA forms that um, aren't necessarily able to capture all of the activities and outcomes that our university center program has. So we're, we've been working um, on a way to capture outcomes and activities and outputs from all EDA programs and to do this in a way that is more comprehensive and allows us to describe more, um, more completely what, what EDA programs are actually accomplishing. Um, so if Ksenia is on right now, I would love to have her talk a little bit more about that because she has been working on this for a couple of years and is the most familiar with it. If she's not muted. Is Benya? Um. Huh. Huh. Mm. Mute. Can't You're her. not muted. <laughs> I'm not the host, though, so I can't. <laughs> I don't know what um, we can do. I'm not sure. Um, that's that's okay. Um, we can we can send out a description uh, regarding that later. Um, but you should all know that Ksenia has been the one kind of working on this and she's really excited to get this going. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to have her on on the next webinar to uh, to walk everyone. Uh, so with that, um, I, if anyone has any other questions, now would be a time to do that. The only other thing, Otherwise, Bernadette, real quick, yeah. I'll, I'll make an announcement. So we are we're having a conference or excuse me, another webinar on September 25th. Um, towards the beginning, actually just a few days after that, we will be having uh, the other association, the Educational Association of, uh, excuse me, the University Economic Development Association will be having their annual conference in Reno, Nevada. Uh, we do have EDA invited to the conference, and I think a uh, representative from the, the um, administration will be there to make a presentation. Um, for those who have not been to a UEDA conference, it is a gathering of about 200 universities from across the country, representing EDA university centers, NIST centers, um, a variety of federal programs that are there, as well as vendors that provide support to university economic development programs. I'd highly recommend coming to the conference. Again, this year's conference will be in Reno. Um, it is a very inexpensive 
venue to go to in terms of uh, subsidized flights and such. So um, the only thing that's somewhat challenging is it, it teeters right on the end of the, the federal year. So the, I believe the conference starts on the 29th and ends on October 2nd. So, but I will uh, share with Bernadette uh, information about that and so we can send it out to everyone. So, all right. Great. Uh, I will say, uh, because we received one question about this, uh, we will have the slides available for everyone. Um, we'll make sure that we send that out afterwards. We just need to clean it up a little bit, possibly. Um, this was also recorded, so that will be available for folks as well. Um, are there, oh, dates of the Reno conference is a question. All right, dates of the Reno conference. You would ask me a technical question, right? When I don't have access to my computer. Yeah. <laughs> Here, hold on, it's coming up on my screen right now. So, I believe it's September 29th through October 2nd, but I just want to verify that with the uh, the website. So, oh, great. Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> Jenna <laughs> posted it out there, September 29th through October 2nd. So, so it starts typically okay. on a, a Sunday evening. So people can fly in on Saturday or Sunday. Uh, we do have a number of tours. Uh, there's a tour on Virginia City, as well as there is a, um, a tour of the Tesla facility outside of Reno, Nevada, which is going to be booking up very quickly. So if you're interested in going, um, I believe they can only take I think it's a total of 150. I could be wrong about that number, but book now, book early uh, if you want to go to that conference. And I'll post the UEDA website link um, onto into the chat area right now. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thanks again to everyone. Uh, we will get the recording and the slides out. Uh, we'll likely post this on EDA's website and it'll be in numerous other places. So stay tuned for an update on that as well as an invite to the next webinar on September 25th. Thanks for letting me tell our story. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. You, Jeff.